Deathly Hallows Part 1 is the first time that we don't really go to Hogwarts. Harry, and Ron, and Hermione are on the run. They're on a kind of mission. They're on a journey. We need to get off the streets, get somewhere safe. We're nowhere is safe, and we could get attacked at any moment. The stakes are a lot higher in this film than they probably ever have been before. It does a lot more grown up. Help us. It's a very different film to the film's past. The first half of the book is a road movie um, uh, in terms of you know, Harry and Ron and Hermione are forced to flee. And so we have a lot of locations we've never seen before. Part one is pretty hectic. There's lots of running around and there is a real sense that, you know, this is going to be uh, Harry's last chance to finish the Voldemort problem once and for all. At the beginning, Harry's left what it was kind of laughingly called his home, which was Privet Drive, which was uh, not much of a home, but it was the only one he had. And he goes to the borough, which feels like home. All together now! One, two, three! Bill and Fleur get married in this one, and it starts off as one of the most hopeful kind of moments in the film, I guess. We were there, kid, mate. <laughs> <laughs> first time. It's great because the whole cast is back and it actually feels like, like a party really in there. It's, it's a great set. The wedding started with a tent and Stuart and I sort of discussed it. Stuart has a very favourite tent shape which we have used before as a tri-wizard tent and he thought it complemented the exterior of the burrow. It isn't a modern contemporary tent. It's very Edwardian in its shape and its silhouette and rather elegant. By all means. It's amazing how, how much richness and interest you can get out of a couple of sheets of canvas, basically. It's much more sophisticated than you would imagine that it would be for the Weasleys. So there was always the feeling of, is this a Weasley wedding? Very Weasley wedding, a lot of red hair. No. That was a debate that went on quite a long time, but we came to that conclusion. It was a Delacour wedding, paid, paid for by Monsieur Delacour, uh, and with a little French style, I suppose. I was looking forward to the wedding because everyone gets together and we all share responsibility for the scene. So it's great and dancing and you know being dressed up. Mrs. Weasley gets to be a bit glamorous. I hope you've noticed. We rarely get a chance uh, to all dress up and, and to do something quite quite different, so it's been fun, but the joy is, is soon destroyed by, by the Death Eaters. The Patronus of Kingsley Shacklebolt appears. And... Now! And warns the room that the Ministry has just fallen under the control of Voldemort and the Death Eaters, and they are coming to the wedding, so everybody suddenly has to evacuate. We operate to London, Piccadilly. Avenue. I used to come to the theatre here with Mum and Dad. They're suddenly in, in London. They are in a place that is a little more fraught and a little bit more threatening, a little bit more dangerous. We went to Piccadilly Circus in central London in you know, a major thoroughfare, major tourist destination. Oh, guys, please don't flash photography. We were the first film to lock off Piccadilly Circus since American Werewolf in London, I believe, which was about 30 years ago. So it's uh, a very, um, very privileged position that we find ourselves in. Piccadilly is a huge job for our location department because most location managers would spend all their energy trying to talk you out of going to Piccadilly Circus because it's a nightmare. But Tu Quinn and Mark Sumner and the team performed a completely brilliant job. Us coming through here, so yeah. You'll be flat, yeah. I've got that, I've got that. Because it's a very populated area, there's a lot of people to contact. We have to keep lights on everywhere. Um, so we've had to contact all the businesses and let them know what we're doing. So it looks as though it's busy. Because after maybe 12.30, this all goes quite dark. And we've had tremendous cooperation from the police who have helped us to stop traffic in various roads around. 
and also uh, the, the councils as well. It, it's a, a collaboration between all sorts of different authorities. It was crazy because literally it was like, like three o'clock in the morning and it just looked like it was everything was open and all the light, they left all the lights on and it was crazy but it was it was really exciting actually. I thoroughly enjoyed myself at that you know, it was a great, really good fun night. It was insane. I think fans all over the globe will enjoy seeing such a famous piece of London in Harry Potter. It makes it kind of real, I guess, in a strange way. If it wasn't what we have to take over the ministry, then none of your places are safe. So we've got these three iconic characters out in our muggle world trying to survive. And they're not really that prepared for it either. You know, they're in a situation whereby they need to learn quickly to protect themselves. So there's a lot of running away and, and hiding and kind of finding people and, and nowhere safe. They never go to any location twice. When they leave, that's it, they don't go back. This is the scene where um, we just found the, the locket, the Horcrux locket, and um, we're going to attempt to destroy it. Incendium. We don't really know anything about these sort of Horcruxes and how to destroy them, and we sort of realise that it's harder than we think. Oh. And normal magic doesn't really work. Reductor! The spells chasing the locket with Sean Vernon Beaches. Beaches is a very, very fine, ecologically cared for and protected site. So we had to make sure that all the materials that we used were benign and safe and weren't going to harm the, the environment in any way. Also, we had to cover large portions of the beaches with snow and or frost. And we had to make sure that they could all be cleared up afterwards, which was the biggest part of the problem. So guys, that completes the shooting here oh, in this winter section here. We had to go up there with fire engines, with hoses, with brooms, with rakes, and literally wash every leaf over an area of probably about four acres. It was, it was a lot of hard work for the boys. <laughs> it looks all right again now. There's a fair amount of running. But also, you know, we do take pause and take the time to engage with the characters and to explore their demons, their thoughts, their relationships, what they're feeling. What's wrong? Wrong? Nothing's wrong. Not according to you, anyway. Ron kind of starts to doubt Harry a little bit. It's a lot to do with Rocket and it kind of changes their personality and it kind of gives them sort of darker thoughts. Ron, please take the rocket off. You wouldn't be saying any of this if you been right. I guess you would. So there's kind of a bit of tension there and we really had to step up in terms of giving a performance that would make that real. David flew up with Dan, Rupert and Emma to Scotland for one day to get a scene. That's a really good spot now. And that was good, okay. The urgency of being in there for a day and being out contributed to the energy of the performance and that was really exciting. Scotland. It really is an astonishingly beautiful place. And up. It's nice to be away from Leaveston and to be out of the usual kind of environment. It's quite bonding. I think everyone's just really happy to be here. Harry and Hermione know that they're heading for a, a particular destination and they have no choice. But it's their destiny. If Dumbledore wanted you to find it but didn't want it falling into the Ministry's hands, where better to hide it than the birthplace of the founder of Gryffindor? Godric's Hollow is where Harry's parents were killed, and emotionally Harry needs to go back and see where his parents died. I still think we should have used Apologies Potion. No. This is where I was born. I'm not returning as somebody else. Strategically, he thinks, well, maybe Bathilda will be there. She can help us with our mission to find the Horcruxes. So there's a real confluence of reasons to go there. of Godric's Hollow is quintessential English. It's a, that half-timbered style is Tudor, Elizabethan style. We look for real villages, as you do, and then in the end just took the real villages as inspiration. 
It's a very traditional early English style, probably 1600 most of the houses. It's a mixture of slightly pink washed cottages, thatched roofs, mostly thatched roofs. And of course we have the potter cottage in it too, which is completely destroyed and um, has brambles growing in the garden. This is where they're guiding me. It seemed just great to have the graveyard underneath the spreading branches of cedar trees. Um, Pinewood has this splendid old garden, part of the original estate before it was ever a studio. And there is one magnificent cedar tree there. So we went there for that tree, literally, uh, and built the graveyard, churchyard, the church, and then the rest of the village around the tree. That's a lot of power for one tree, but it was worth it. Stuart built this beautiful little churchyard, and we put the snow in it, and the snow sort of moves in such a beautiful way. It's a really haunting scene. It was tough for Dan. Harry he actually ends up going to the graveyard and finding his parents' grave. <sighs> Merry Christmas, Amani. Merry Christmas, Harry. It's a very, very emotional scene, and hopefully that will come across in the film. We're seeing a lot more depth in these characters, I think, now, especially when it's such a dark time. And we don't really know what we're doing either, so it's kind of hard. Look, you've got no idea where the next Hawkwax is, and neither do I. But this, this means something. There is a symbol, which is the symbol of the Deathly Hallows, and so they go to the only person that they know who has any contact with it, which is Xenophilius Lovegood. Luna. They go to the Lovegood house, and obviously, it's completely new and it's like it's, this is where she was born. <laughs> you see it and you just know what, where it all came from, why she's how she is. Keep off the dirigible plums. Jo Rowling was pretty specific about that. She describes it as a black tower. And so that's exactly what it needed to be. You know? So there was no room for variance there. The one thing I did try to do, as I usually do, is, is make a good sculptural shape of it. So it isn't just a cylinder. It's a cylinder with a very deliberate lean and a very deliberate taper. And the house has been lovingly vandalised by Luna. You know, there's, she's got her drawings right across the house. Here we go then, let's do a rehearsal, please. We love the idea of the painting, having it decorated, and we wanted to get some input from Ivana, who plays Luna. She's always very intrigued by the art department and all of our work. And she, she did some lovely drawings and gave us some really good ideas. They had um, an artist come in and design all these little creatures that they talk about. Um, she told me that she used the book Fantastic Beasts somewhere to find them, which is what J.K. Rowling wrote, and, um, and she would look at them and she'd draw. Such a weird building, really. It was, um, it was quite a fun scene. And then we get attacked again, and everything goes goes wrong. A treacherous little bleeder. Is there no one we can trust? As the film progresses, Harry, Ron, and Hermione become ever more in danger. Hello, beautiful. They were just up a week at this forest, and we yeah we get chased by the snatchers. Snatcher! We were setting up these shots where they would be chased through the forest. And I, I said, all right, I'll do a take, and I'll let them just get the hang of it. So I go to take one. And they go, <laughs> And I think, whoa! It's because they are trying to outcompete each other. Dan wants to run faster than Emma. Emma wants to run faster than Dan. And Rupert just wants to be anywhere to try and keep up with a pair of them. Are you guys secretly competing? Who's going to get oh, the yeah. fastest? Oh, really yeah. <laughs> All three of us will be saying, I was the fastest. He's yeah. amazing. The first take was the most amazing, like, <laughs> James Bond style well, cartwheel over I it. Hit it. I hit it. Hit it at quite a pace and then just sort of flopped over it. They're all going to say that the fast is. I am. Emma said, Emma probably didn't she? <laughs> She's wrong, I'm faster than Emma. I'm saying <laughs> Rupert knows he's not the fastest. Thinking about it, that's just him. He's just mouthing off then. First time I've run in a long time. Emma really impressed me, and she can run. I mean, she left a lot of them for staying there. I was so pleased. I gave the boys a good one for their money. 
definitely. <laughs> I, I could be her. There's, there's not even a question in my mind. If you talk, well, it depends what distance. I mean, you're talking about, but short distances, I, uh, every time, no problem. <laughs> um, we'll, we'll, we'll cue you guys when to start running on this because you're actually faster than them. And um, yeah, <laughs> 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 okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I don't care. You call, I'll call it red carpet next premiere. We'll do it. I'll have a race, man. Make it 100 yards. I'll do it. Um, <laughs> I'm up for that. I'm not that I'm competitive at all. Ah! It's actually funny. David has to take us aside and say, I just want to remind you that this scene is about the film, not about which one of you can run the fastest. We all sort of went away with our, with our heads down, like, oh, that's quite embarrassing. It's weird having someone chase you, how that kind of makes you run faster, really. <laughs> But um, it's all a bit tense because essentially, if they kind of find it's Harry, it's all over really, um, and uh, Voldemort wins. Change of plan. We're not taking this lot to the ministry. It's a really intense ending. We're at Malfoy's Manor, we're being captured, and uh, we're, we're in a pretty sticky uh, position. <sighs> Malfoy Manor uh, was based on Hardwick Hall, in a, uh, an Elizabethan house in Derbyshire. The real house is extraordinary in, in that the windows are huge, and the ratio of glass to masonry is, is very strange. They have a mysterious, slightly threatening, and rather magical quality, these acres of glass. So we took that form and designed a gothic roof for it. And then invented two big interiors. So one is the, the kind of ground floor entrance hall, uh, and the other is the big drawing room immediately above that. And an, an elaborate staircase that kind of links the two. This is my house. It's not much of my royal home. The house itself is fantastic. Well, as soon as we got on set together, we wanted a family portrait in the, uh, in the Malfoy Manor. It's extremely nice. We've got an organ. Amazing, that's clearly what Draco does in his spare time. Little did we know, he's a fantastic organist. The ceiling's about 30 foot high, so we've got a couple of chandeliers, so I thought we must be doing pretty well for ourselves. But I will confess, the floor was a little dusty. Um, so I don't know whether that's down to the, uh, the big big war of the worlds going on, or, or just our own, our own laziness, I'm not sure. You dare to talk to me like that in my own house! There's something about the space itself, and something about the lines of the place that makes it feel like a soulless building. The people who've been doing the sets for this have managed every single time to produce things that are not only right, unquestionably right within Harry Potter's universe, but new and different and fresh and breathtaking every time. Everybody is really ambitious to make the very best work they can, and the new and different locations really helped the performances. It felt much more immediate and very real and powerful. It's just how I remember it. The trees, the river, everything. The parts where we are on the road should have a sense that we are moving towards something momentous. <laughs> The last frame fades to black of the first film. I'm hoping people just can't wait to come back to see the, the story continue. Ah! Super